I'm back. And today we're going to be talking with Susie Maxwell about uh, what a denturist is, what she does, some tips on um, the all on four treatment or all on X, full mouth implant treatment. So she should be coming on here soon. Get your questions ready. I know that many of you who are Americans don't know what a denturist is. And I didn't know in dental school until my senior year that I had met somebody um, who wasn't. So let's see, Susie's coming on. Hey, Jack. Thomas, hey, Thomas. Hey, hey how's it hi. going? Hey, Good. I'm saying hi to everybody who's come on. Excellent. Hello. Nice to see you. Good to see you too. Yeah. How is, uh, how's everything going in Toronto? We are doing well. We are um, just hanging in there like the rest of you guys. Like yeah. a little less crazy than the States, but uh, yeah. it's still scary, right? It, it sure is. Yeah. So have you guys been shut down for a few weeks now? Yeah, we uh, we had our notice on the 15th of March that everything is to be closed aside from emergency care. So, yeah, yeah pretty much yeah. Uh, most clinics are closed. There are some, obviously, the oral surgery clinics and some dental offices that are have remained open. But most dental offices have kind of forwarded them to, to someone else in emergency yeah. care. Yeah, yeah, same with us, too. So why don't you introduce yourself for anyone who doesn't know you? Okay. Well, my name is Susie Maxwell. I'm a denturist in uh, Toronto, in Canada, and uh, have been practicing for, I want to say, 18 years now, I think. So um, my practice over the last 13 years has been strictly on the all on four or the full arch approach. So that's kind of why I think you have me on here. Is that's yeah. all. I've been, I've been uh, lucky and fortunate to make that kind of my my area of expertise cool mm -hmm. so what phil's already making comments is she he? made me famous he said <laughs> yeah he's like my super fan famous. yeah <laughs> we have uh well of course you guys all know the raptors right yeah and uh there's a super fan <laughs> and he's at every game and cheering the team on and and phil's definitely i think we're each other's i i think yeah. and his obviously and uh we're a good team. <laughs> so tell me more. Or I know a little bit, but let's tell kind of everyone who's watching, what is a denturist? So, okay. Well, first of all, in Canada and the States, we're called denturist. In mm. uh, the UK, we are called clinical dental technicians. Oh, I didn't know And that. Um, in Australia, we are called dental prosthetist. Okay. <laughs> it's like kind of a strange name, but yeah, so there are a few of us out there in the world. And, um, but basically, depending on the jurisdiction, uh, what we're allowed to do varies. And for us in Canada, we work on obviously um, anything removable. So whatever can be removed by the patient technically. Um, mm -hmm. Or so we, initially it was just full dentures and then it moved to full dentures and partial dentures. And then it's um, you know, developed to being locators, borrower dentures, and all on four. So it's uh, depending on where you are. I know some, some provinces in Canada, you know, they have less allowances than, than others. In Alberta, for instance, I believe they can do even, they can restore everything but a single implant. So you can do oh. bridges. You do it the whole mouth except for Interesting. one tooth. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can do yeah. all the hard stuff. Oh, is Spiros <laughs> on here too? Yay. <laughs> All your friends. Yeah, Spiros is uh, one of my Nobel reps. Uh, Ed oh, and cool. I just saw Trish come on there too. And I haven't even been looking to see who's signing in. I better look. <laughs> um, this is my first time doing this. So. Oh, good. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, Spiros is uh, one of my go-to reps. Uh, you, you can't really do this type of treatment without the support of many people it's a huge yeah. team approach and team for me is also the sales reps mm -hmm. uh, they play a huge part in it and uh, I, I will just tell you a quick story about Spiros I called him on a Saturday morning I was at an office and 
they we needed a bailout we needed some actives and uh i called through house at like 8 30 in the morning like hi what you doing he's like sleeping and I'm like, <laughs> any chance you want to drive go for a drive a nice drive today and bring us up something Drop if you have plans. Yeah. and he did and uh you know everything went through and that's that takes a lot of commitment and great team yeah. to work with yeah. yeah that's definitely definitely helpful in those yeah. pinches <laughs> so so once the implants are placed you then basically fun function like a periodontist you do the impression you do the try-ins like the a final. prosthodontist yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah very very cool so when you first got out of school you were just doing full dentures right before mm -hmm. it kind of moved to a uh, more implant related practice yeah so you, yeah go ahead um because I have so many questions, too, that I've been wanting to ask for so many years. Do Can denturists in Canada have their own practice where all they yes. do is dentures? Oh, yeah. cool. So okay. I actually, when I graduated, I worked uh, with a gentleman for a couple of years and just gained a little bit more experience. And then I opened up my own office. And so we worked directly to the public and in Canada you know, and I think probably in the States a lot too, like not a lot of people want to do dentures, right? Yeah. Um, the dentists here in Canada, they might spend a day on it in school. Yeah. And so the dentists actually refer those patients to us uh, and okay. they can also come direct from marketing. Uh, mm -hmm. So I actually opened up my own clinic and worked for a few years and I'll be honest, when I went to school, I had zero training on implants. So yeah, me too. Yeah, it was like, and it was daunting to. I remember going to um, our big uh, annual uh, general meeting and, and our conference, and Dr. Bongard actually did a full arch all on four case, and I was like, "Wow, yeah. that's amazing. That's yeah. like something that I could accept if the, I was in this patient situation." And I went to one of the courses that they then put on, like a hands-on program, and I was, I did it, but I was lost. I'm like, if I brought this sure. back to my office, there's no way I can implement this. I, there was like the components and everything. This was my first actual look at it was all on four. Yeah. <laughs> so for an implant exposure, that was my first one. And um, I, uh, anyways, I ended up thinking, well, this is what I should be offering them. And I was telling people about it, but couldn't do it in my office, didn't have the know-how. And uh, I just didn't like doing dentures. I thought if someone gave them to me, I would throw them out the window, you know? So uh, I could make a change in someone's appearance. I could make a right. change in, you know, in, in their aesthetic, but not in function, I don't believe. Um, yeah. Now, my, my uncle, he's an anomaly. I can't give him implants. He has a full set of dentures that I made him, and he is... And he loves them? Yep. Can't sell him. I can't <laughs> give him implants, so let alone, yeah. you know. But anyways, long story short, I actually had planned to get out of um, this business entirely. I had um, a clinical dental technician from England was working with yeah. me. And he, um, hey, Sharif, <laughs> and uh, uh, he said, have you ever thought about selling your practice? I'm like, well, I've only opened it three years ago, right? Like, <laughs> what am I supposed yeah. to do? And I thought about it that night, and I came back. He said, yeah. And he bought it from me, and I thought, okay, well, wow. that, now what? And um, a week before the closing date, where I currently work, they phoned and they said, we heard you're selling your clinic. Would you come work with us? And wow. so I went into Strictly an Olive Four Clinic. And so I was yeah. like, and that's kind of history of me. <laughs> and so you guys do, so you'll take the impression, you'll set up the teeth, you do all the tech, the, the lab portion of it as well, right? Mm -hmm. In so, both the provisional and the final. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So where I am, so t right now I kind of do a few things on, I work four days a week at Chrysalis where I'm doing the pre-op workup for all these cases and then mm -hmm. doing the post-op appointments as well as the final uh, uh, fabrication. So mm -hmm. all uh, final impressions, bar trines, all that stuff, inserts. Yeah. Um, but then I do self out on the Friday. That's okay. And uh, so, so look at Phil, okay. for instance, I'll be with Phil sometimes uh, at Chrysalis. I have 10 technicians there. They do all the lab work and I'm strictly seeing patients yep. all day. But then if I go and I float to another office with uh, Phil or whoever, I work with a number of uh, different uh, dentists and, and oral surgeons that 
then I come along with my carts <laughs> that I bring in. <laughs> I bring all my stuff to anyone's office and yeah. we can do this there. And uh, then I will do the clinical and the lab work there. Super cool. So what is your, are you doing, are you doing everything with denture teeth now? Are you doing any like full contour zirconia bars or what's like your, your favorite materials now? Uh, so right now, so I have done only a couple zirconia. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm unsure because I've only done a couple. I'm not, yeah. um, I know we have to put more out there and, and just see how it goes. I'm nervous. I like the idea of zirconia for many reasons, but then right now we are strictly, well, mostly, um, acrylic with acrylic teeth yeah. around a titanium bar. Yeah. And I like that because if they break, you can... Repair. fix it you yeah. know very easily and mm -hmm. um and i do believe that there is i i, ha I inserted the zirconia case and this guy and immediately i mean you've got to get your fingers out of the way fast because when he bites <laughs> he's like a, a monster um but he bit down and i i noticed it was it was loud compared yeah. to him with the acrylic and i thought how many patients will you know will that bother i'm not yeah. sure yeah yeah, that was something that um, one of my professors who became uh, one of my friends, a guy named Mamali Rashad, you may know Mamali speaks for Nobel. Um, he told me that you need to tell the patient that this may click. Mm -hmm. And so some of the, there's positives and negatives to everything, right? So, you know, zirconia, it's strong in compressive forces, but bad in tensile forces. So it's right. more likely to fracture instead of bend like, like another material. Um, Phil said, do you have much experience with zirconia? Yeah, I do. Um, most of the, the full arch cases that I do, I do in full contour zirconia. And that came from, so I started out doing kind of similar to what you guys did. And then I had some teeth break off, which mm -hmm. is fine if it's in the back and it's not aesthetic, but it's bad when it's an aesthetic emergency for for patients, I think. Right. So then I think the idea started to be, okay, we'll do zirconia on top so that we don't have an aesthetic emergency and then we'll do denture teeth down below so that right. even if we do have something break, um, it's not going to be as, as bit of, big of an aesthetic emergency. And then it's kind of gone towards zirconia on zirconia. Um, but yeah, I think the jury's still out on what's best, but that's mostly what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And I guess right now with us having such a large in-house lab, we, we ha it, it's going to slow us down to speed us up. You sure. Know, like to do, like, to any, go digital, like anything new. Yeah. yeah. And we really run at a, well, huh, right now, <laughs> no speed, but um, <laughs> yeah. we run at a very, very high speed. There's no room or time to slow down to learn to do that. Yeah. And to take a whole team, honestly, it's like a, it's a well-oiled machine. Um, I know we will be moving that way, uh, but it's it's going to take some some getting used to, that's for sure. Yeah, I think that's the problem with any type, any type of technology is that mm -hmm. you do have to slow down to speed up and yeah. you have to train your whole team and everything that they felt comfortable with. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard. Someone who definitely knows the digital workflow, Raphael, is on. Um, but I think that's probably like with how we do it. I just posted a case today, how we do it now with the digital workflow makes it so that we at least know that the aesthetics on the first try are going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. Now we may still have to adjust function and that's getting better in the digital workflow, but it's nice to be able to put something in the mouth and know it's going to fit with the lower lip. It's going to fill the buckle corridors. The, the um, proportions are going to be, are going to be right. That that's what I always struggled with when I was setting teeth or putting them in people's mouths is, you know, I put them in, then I have to, okay, I got to pull this one down a little bit. Okay. Mm -hmm. then make this one. And I'm like melting wax and you know, all the stuff that you guys do so fast, it takes me forever. That no, I'm pretty sure was, I drive. Um, I, yeah. I'm pretty sure I drive my technicians crazy because <laughs> that'll be, you know, <laughs> until the deal always is, you know, we both have to like them being the patient and me. And if we both don't love them, yep. we don't finish. And, 
I yeah. can have a patient say, oh, I like them at nine in the morning and I don't like them till four in the afternoon. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the technicians, I've been they, there. They, they, uh, they're great guys. I can tell you, and girls, I've got a great team I work with. So I'm, I'm lucky. Have you done any crazy designs, like people that want really crooked teeth or people that want like really interesting things? Do you have any stories about those? I sure do. <laughs> so, well, I mean, this is, so I've had men come in wanting, uh, one guy came in, he wanted Julia Roberts teeth when he should, okay. I always encourage people to bring pictures, yeah. you know, bring. And so when I looked at it, I was like, oh, okay, well, a couple of <laughs> things we need to talk about. <laughs> I can give you those teeth, but just remember her frame and the frame of her mouth and her lips yeah. is not what you have. So right. that, that tooth <laughs> setup I can give you, but the lips, you know, she's, uh, those are hers. Yeah. And so it's kind of meeting those expectations. Now, Phil and I, we had um, a, a patient that uh, there's a whole list I could give you about this patient that to talk about, but we're going to talk about the teeth as she brought in um, pictures of a vampire. And nice. she wanted teeth like that. And I'm like, okay, well. <laughs> At least I have canine guidance, right? <laughs> yeah. Not so good on acrylic teeth, right? Sure. Like, so um, I was able to compromise, you know, where we just made them pointy but not long. Because I okay. explained to her, and yeah. I, I mean, it normally I wouldn't even entertain that because it, it's this is my work too, right? So yeah. I don't want to necessarily yeah, put signature. that out to the world. But uh -huh. she, unfortunately, is awful to say, is not a well person and, and doesn't, you know, we just wanted to give her teeth, make her happy. She does, she does not, she's fighting a battle of cancer that yeah. is not a, not a winning battle. So I was like, oh, okay, just do this and give it to her and let her be happy. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. But I have had to tell people, no, I had uh, another person want vampire teeth. And I said, no. And she said, but that's what I want. And I said, that's fine. And you can have that. You just can't have that here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there that's might be good. someone else that will do it. But um, learning how to I say no. Yeah. If they, as soon as they go to an excursive movement, that tooth is going to fly off. Uh -huh. So it's just, yeah. Yeah. Have, um, <laughs> why don't you take me through what your guys' steps are? So like, Let's say Phil just placed implants, and does he give it to you with multi units on and um, cover caps on the multi units, or how does um, that work? Well, we usually uh, place the implants first, the bone reduction, and, and we give them the denture with a, a bone reduction guide in it. Yeah, I've seen that. that looks, mm. That's a cool idea. I like that. Yeah, and that works. So really you do well. a clear denture, or you do the actual denture with no, the. No, we just do the one. actual one. Yeah. yeah the actual one and then uh and then the implants are placed once we know that they're good then we put the abutments on and mm -hmm. using that denture as well putting yep. uh, holes in them to to kind of direct where they're going to go and then um he will usually suture up a bit close it up a bit and we will yep. do a pickup we mm -hmm. typically pick up just the anterior temporary copings okay um i know there are different ways of doing it and i've yeah. done it both ways and uh, you can pick up all of them at once or you can pick mm -hmm. up the anterior ones i'm a big fan of picking up just the anterior for okay. the reason that the the holes that you have to make i like to make them as small as possible in the posterior the teeth that we've designed and the occlusion you designed i don't want to go and destroy it by throwing a big burr in it yeah. so Oh, sorry. Someone is actually knocking at my door. Um, That's <laughs> okay. <laughs> sorry. I think Let's see like, what happens. Uh, yeah. This, this is, is fun. <laughs> sorry. We'll Hi. see who comes to the front. Okay. Okay. Can I just take this? <laughs> sorry. I'm on a call. This one? Thank you. It's That's good. Thank you. Susie. <laughs> sorry. Real life. Oh, it's, yeah. Real life stuff. Henry Shine. Make... Thank you. I just All right. some... Uh, Cabby wipes. Sorry, so you're going to take a tour through my house. So you're going to have to take the cabby wipes out and wipe the box. Right. And yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I like, I didn't know who was calling me, but that's it was what's so fun about delivery. live videos. <laughs> um, yeah. So, anyways, I'm a big fan of doing the anterior pickups because okay. I can keep the, the tooth integrity in the posterior. Mm -hmm. And then for. Uh, for me, I always have a model. Always, always, always. So we can always make a nice uh, integral surface by 
um, almost post damning the model, mm -hmm. but also that when a lot of times when people pick up all of them in the mouth, they leave this step and they don't have an accurate model should anything need repaired or when they do go to final that transitional needs to be secured to something or it will warp um, when it's stored. So I use it for travel model. Uh, if they go somewhere, a lot of our patients, yeah. they travel. And if they have anything go wrong, wherever they are, then it's much easier for them to take this model in and have it fixed. Um, uh, you know, then them start monkeying around with the parts and pieces. So, so do you, I said parts and pieces. I know oh, the reps hate when we say components, that. Components, components. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> I've been like, um, I'm sorry, Trish. like been, been trained so much by yeah. these implant companies. Like, they're not parts and pieces. Mm -hmm. People won't pay big money for parts and pieces, but <laughs> they will true. pay them for components. Right. Um, <laughs> So, <laughs> so you pick up, you pick up just the anterior two so that you can attach it to the denture, but mm -hmm. then you take a separate impression mm -hmm. that then you finish on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is whether, right? I, yep. And whether I pick up all of them in the mouth or the mm -hmm. anterior, I always take a separate impression and it's yeah. fitted to that. And that's where the base, the rebasing of it comes okay. onto that model. And how do you take your impression? Do you splint anything together? Or do you just do them individual or what's your, your way of so, doing it? So uh, I always do open tray uh, okay. with it splinted. Um, uh -huh. I use these braided wires that are cut into a million different sizes. Sections, and uh -huh. Yeah, we just loot them individually. Um, once they're looted in the surgical impression, it's just a putty, a heavy body putty impression. Yeah. So if it's not looted, the putty doesn't have the same flow, then you can have huge voids and actually the impression copings could be mobile. So yeah. always have it looted and then the putty, you don't want to use anything too flowable. It'll go underneath the sutures and pull them out when you go to right. remove it. Right. And then, okay, so let's say you finish the, the initial provisional, right? The patient's worn that. You're going back to do... <laughs> Sorry, did you... Phil just called it, oh, he thinks it's Uber Eats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> everybody's trolling you now. And then Trish says it's wine, so... That would be nice. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> she already got her palette of wine yesterday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're going back to do the final, final impression. Now, how do you do the final impression? How do, do you I do have, that? yeah, how do you do your final impression once, because you already have a model mm -hmm. and oh. you're going to do your, or do you not, do you take a new impression? Yeah, always. Okay. So a lot of times during the transitional, if they're not as amazing as Dr. Walton and they don't place the abutments quite as I wish, mm -hmm. um, you may change abutments before the final okay. impression. So then you would need a new one. Um, the only time I don't take a new final impression is if the patient was a severe gagger. Yeah. Then we know that on the day of, instead of pouring that impression up in snap stone, we're going to pour it up in dye stone and it. have it as a, as a permanent model. But um, yeah, on uh, the tissue has recontoured. So generally from the time of surgery to the time we do, you know, a few months later, the swelling has come out, there's spaces and air gaps. So taking a new impression will show us exactly what the tissue uh, healing is. So, And do you do any like um, confirmation jigs or anything like that? Or have you done those in the past? Mm -hmm. So sometimes um, we, <laughs> what's he saying? All the time. <laughs> okay. No, we're good. Um, yeah. Uh, the odd time I do. If um, So if I know that the impression copings are kind of a little too off angle or you take uh -huh. the impression out and you're like, oh, that was a bit of a, you know, an effort to take it out, um, we'll usually do a, a jig just to... And do you do it with stone or do you do it with pattern resin or what's your, your go-to for doing a verification so, jig? They will basically take um, those, the impression copings, or the, sorry, mm -hmm. temporary copings, and they will put those uh, braided wires and make yep. a double, a double jig on both sides, and then I'll just try that in. And if it, Got it. if it fits, great. If it doesn't, it's a new impression. Yeah. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. And then um, you guys do a bar try-in? Mm-hmm. And then do you do a, to a tooth try-in? 
No. So I um, do that in one stage. Basically, we will do uh, the, the teeth will be set up on the titanium bars. Okay. When I go to try it in, uh, the, there will be no wax underneath the bar, just so it's free clearance. I can see Got underneath it. it that there's no impingement of the tissue. If they feel any tension or tightness, it's because the bar is not passive and not from wax pushing somewhere. Right. Um, if That's there a good are, point. yeah, um, thanks. <laughs> if there are teeth um, in the way or through a screw hole, then those teeth are removed. And so my my conversation with the patient is always, okay, today we're going to do a try-in. We're going to, the teeth are set up in wax on the titanium bar. There will be some teeth missing. Don't worry about that. That's just so I have access to the screw holes without any interference. Mm -hmm. There are spaces underneath the bar. And that is so that, again, I can see through, make sure it's passive. Then, you know, my assistant, my main assistant, her name's Diane. Diane will take them for an x-ray to confirm okay. the seating of the bar. Um, only what kind if of x-ray do you take for that? I take a Panorex. Okay. Yeah. Um, only if I feel that the bar feels passive. So I can yeah. feel it, you know, you get used to feeling it. And if there, I feel sure. any tension on those little screws, there's no point. Um, we, we try to figure out what the problem is first. And then, uh, and then when they come back from the x-ray, then it's removed the teeth that were off or put on now. And then we do the aesthetic part of the try-in. Okay, cool. Mm-hmm. And then how do you, um, and then do you have the patient back for the final delivery? Do you do it that day or do you process? No, they come back. Yeah. It? Okay, cool. So how many appointments do we have? So we have like an initial appointment, let's say, um, let's, let's say you don't do surgery on that day. Then you have a surgical day. Then do you do a post-op after surgery? Yeah, we usually do uh, three post-op appointments. Three post stops, Two. and and how long do you do you guys usually wait, or does that depend on the surgeon? No, uh, typically it's a two week post op always. Okay. Um, that at that appointment we remove the prosthetic. First, we check, you know, are, is their bite reasonably close to what yep. we had? Uh, if they happen to be like biting like that, you know, because yeah, we find it's a lot more. Well, obviously, it's a lot more complicated doing a double arch pickup than For a sure. single arch. And depending on whether that double arch is under GA or if it's just under, mm-hmm. you know, twilight, that also makes a huge difference. So GA uh, double arch pickups, I'm always kind of crossing my fingers to make sure it was done right. <laughs> because right. if I'm not in the room, I'm a little panicky They wake up it. and they're like, I love it. It yeah. just is great. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I don't. It, you know, GA is not my favorite thing. I'll, I'll be yeah. honest. It's, it's, uh, I'd like to abolish it. <laughs> it's great. It's great for the surgeon. I know. It's bad for the denturist or whoever is doing the prosthetic. Yeah. You can't see if like midlines are on or anything. Cause you know, they're, the tubes up there, eh, nose and right, right, right. pain, and they're not helpful at all. You can't ask them to close. Uh, yeah. they're just out. So how often do you find when patient comes back at two weeks, the bite is off? It's not usually that off. Um, I would say, I mean, we always adjust it. Um, yeah, I do. Sure. A, I use a T scan. Oh, okay, um, great. Yeah, yeah. Look at the that, technology. Come oh, on. Oh yeah. <laughs> technology. <laughs> not a lot of people is, are using, so that's good. Yeah, it's amazing, and it really—it's a great tool. It's an expensive tool, but it's yeah. fantastic. And for an OCD person, it can be a bit of a nightmare. <laughs> you, right. You know, you see, oh, twelve percent there, thirteen. You're like, I want to make <laughs> it just, just perfect. And, wow. Yeah, I could see that. But it is uh, fantastic and, uh, you know, a very good indicator for, you know, the occlusal, um, uh, you know, just balancing it out. It's night and day. How long have you been using that? Years, probably five, six years. Wow. Yeah. Ahead of the curve on that for sure. Yeah. So it's, uh, I, I'm, I think I'm the only one in the office that uses it actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, everyone else gets frustrated with it, but I just see like, it's right there in front of you in black and white to, to see it's hard to, to deny what it's telling you. And I, you know, the, for me, I'm, I'm usually seeing them at two week post-op, so it, okay. it makes sense for me to use it. And what occlusal scheme do you like to do at the time of provisional placement? Like I know some people say, only canine to canine, or some people say only to 
contact in the first premolars and drag in the back or like what's right. your your um, input on that? Well, we definitely, I would say 95% of the time, it's six to six. We are okay. full and we are balancing out on all of them. On two-week post-op, I, I try to lighten up on the sixes a bit, but okay. that's it. Um, we're looking at group function. So yep. uh, obviously. Like a yeah. traditional venture, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and then really I found taking the time to look at your crossover, especially in the anterior teeth. So when they're going uh -huh. forward and back, making sure that they're not rising up on one tooth. Yeah. Uh, because that is where you'll see a lot of... Uh, snapping off of the teeth so so then I'm thinking from an aesthetic standpoint and an occlusal standpoint if mm -hmm. we're gonna have anterior guidance and you want to have anterior guidance on like all four incisors but you also want to have two dominant centrals will you make the provisionals not as dominant so that or will you just try to make all four at the same do you, do you see what I'm getting at you see what I'm asking yeah. Like if, if the two centrals are much longer, then you'll end up just guiding on those. Right. Yep. And so do you say, let's get rid of aesthetics for a little bit and make the centrals a little bit shorter than the provisional, but then maybe change it in the final? Or will you just try to design? Yeah, right um, from the get-go. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I, we try as, as, you know, I try as much as possible to do it so that in the finals you can copy it. Yeah. My my opinion is that these patients are coming in, they're paying 50000 and when they leave, this is their wow factor. Their wow yeah. factor is that day. It's not for the finals. Right. So, you know, they've been waiting. And, and generally, what's got them in there to begin with has been something. Like, whether it's they're going to a wedding, it's their daughter's graduation, it's something. Yeah. It's, it's always it's, something. Yeah, there's something that mm -hmm. has pushed them over the edge. And so that's kind of the exciting time for yeah. me and, and you know, to give them this. And so I try to nail it if I can right out of the park. Yeah, I think that's a good thing to yeah. get them to already believe in you at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And then when they come in for the final, then it's just like, yeah, just do that, but make it with the, with the bar inside. Yeah, yeah. How difficult is it to work with multiple implant systems? Because you are like a referral-based kind of um, clinician. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sure you've worked with every implant system out there. To be honest, I would say I have worked on, well, three. Okay. I would say 90 5% of all my cases have been Nobel, that we okay. are a heavy Nobel office. I've done, uh, we've uh, transitioned in, in one of the offices into more Strawman. And uh -huh. so I've been getting my hands in that now and exposure to, to their system. I've done, well, of course, you get the odd patient who got this implant in Brazil and this plant in right. India and this one here <laughs> and this one there. And those are the cases that get sent over my way. So yeah. I think there's a, a lady I have who I think she has six different types of implants, six or seven. Oh and um, yeah, that's a fun, like everything. My assistant knows she has to get these special dishes out and everything's labeled and everything's, you know, because as soon as you yeah. take out everything, you screw up one right. screw or something and it's just a nightmare. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> but yeah, because working with different implant systems and you know i've restored uh, you know almost every implant system but i think that's where you see a lot of differences with implant systems mm -hmm. is like what's available i was restoring something i don't know a month or two ago i guess it's probably two months ago because a month ago i wasn't really working um <laughs> yeah. and this company didn't have tie bases and it was so weird to think that like there's a company right. that doesn't have tie base and it's like a major company too and yeah. just little things like that you start getting used to if you work with you know one or two oh, systems hi Kevin. pretty normally this is one of my you know what this is what i gotta say is one of my patients actually oh, really? just popped oh, on. Cool. Hi. <laughs> one of my favorites just amazing <laughs> that's awesome we all have our yeah. favorite patients that we're friends <laughs> yeah. with on facebook or yep. instagram <laughs> yeah i have many of those um i was saying that you really see the difference in the restorative components on implant companies Mm -hmm. And whenever people are asking me about implant companies, I always tell them, like, 
you can make any implant work and do well, but it's the restorative side is where oftentimes they fall short on yeah. options or heights or widths or materials or mm -hmm. whatever it is. And yeah. so that's what, um, and your support, just that. the support. I find yeah, like, the huge. customer support that's there to help you through, you know, it's always nice when it's a textbook case and everything goes sure. hunky dory, but that's not real life. So you want to make sure you have the team that's going to be there to help you, you know, because yeah. you, you're going to need it. Are you doing many cases like your surgeons that are uh, more than four implants? you know, up mm -hmm. to eight, what's, mm -hmm. what are you seeing mostly now? You know what? It depends on the surgeon. I have, uh, <laughs> you know, say, you know, Phil, he's Phil's typical. He'll do like four or five, you know, yep. that's the, you know, the norm. And a lot of my surgeons will do that. I have some that just can't seem to get past doing four. They have to do eight. <laughs> so uh -huh. it just, it's a comfort zone. I don't know, yeah. you know, However, it's it's whatever they feel. We don't charge differently based on mm -hmm. how many they get. So the, the patient doesn't get to choose, oh, I'm going to pay just for the four implant option. Right, it, right, right. You yeah. get what the surgeon feels you need. So it really depends yeah. on the surgeon and obviously the bone quality. I think that's a good way of doing it is because I've done that too, to where like, you know, if I place four, if I place six or if I place eight, mm -hmm. um, there's, it's not a, not a big difference because then you, you're right. You get the patients that are like, well, let's just do four then, you know, like that, that's fine. Yeah. Well, you may need more. Yeah. What, what is your opinion on splinted versus individual bridges? We're, I, well, I'm only splinted. So okay. that's, uh, that's all I've done. Um, I, I think that, cross arch stabilization and that whole you know they all work together nicely Ideology. if you happen to mm -hmm. yeah and if you lose an implant on one you know you can gain strength in the other so i'm mm -hmm. not sure i think a bridge could be a massive failure you know if you happen to lose on this side that's a whole part that you know yep. you need stability from that you you have no friends to help it out right you know um yeah, but I think that, again, that really is a, is a patient um, decision, you know, like there is yeah. a difference in it, right? There, there are differences. And so I think it's really on, um, it's really what the patient requires. There's a question was, do you splint FP1s as well? Um, I do. I, I just, the case I posted today was an FP1 that um, was splinted, but um what what is your thought on that? If you don't have any gingiva and it's just a tooth only, tooth only defect, you split it's, everything, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that some of the the on the restoration level, um, does that mean like implant level, or do you mean on um, abutment level? Is that what you're asking? Restoration level. I, the case that we did that I posted today was on four implants and it was on a multi-unit abutment. So again, at, at abutment level. Yeah. 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 I mean, I have some cases that are at implant level and some that are abutment level, but the tissue is always so much nicer abutment level. So we just don't, we don't really do it without abutments. Yeah. Yeah. I like abutment level on most of my, my full arch cases for sure. Um, mm -hmm. Going to implant level is much more difficult unless you're doing like splinted bridges. And then oftentimes you still have to have the components. That's one of those things that comes down to components of mm -hmm. an implant system because certain implant system, their non-engaging implant level abutments don't engage the, the conical connection. So then you right. turn the conical connection into a flat to flat connection. And then you have like, Oh, it's restoratively easy, but biologically it's not great. Right. And so I struggle with certain uh, implant companies on that, which is why on those cases I may go to a Butman level. Mm -hmm. So when they cross arts without multi units, or FP1 is not easy, especially in pre maxilla. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. If you're going across arch on a maxilla and you have the, the maxilla, maxilla implants, even if they're placed correctly, kind of coming like this. If you don't have multi-units, it's going to be very difficult to get to get passive fit on that. So yeah, 
Yeah. 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 Multi units, you get much easier passive fit. You get the great biology. You get restorative flexibility. One yeah. abutment, one time. I think that's one thing that people oftentimes don't think about with all on X treatment is that oftentimes they're so successful surgically, like the implants look great over time because you did a one abutment, one time concept. Mm -hmm. So you're not taking things in and out all yeah. the time. You um, reduced the bone. So the tissue can become thicker. So you automatically get some of these zero bone loss concepts within mm -hmm. those one of them one time concept. You have titanium, which is good to the tissue and uh, you have thick tissue. And so you, long term, you get pretty good stability on this emergency. Emergence of multi units is not that great. This aesthetics may not be that pretty. The emergence of multi units are not that great. That depends on the implant system. Mm -hmm. There are certain implant systems that have better emergence profiles than others, I think. Opinion on platform switch versus non platform switched implants. Well, both can work. I would say it's easier to make platform switched implants work. But um, I would say look up Thomas Linkovicious uh, zero bone loss concepts for, for those. What do you think on that when you do uh, platform switch versus non-platform switched implants? You probably don't work with very many non-platform switched implants anymore, right? No, no. Unless anybody's doing like um, old like Nobel Replace or you still have any surgeons that are placing those? No, not really. No, I would say no. <laughs> yeah. Everyone that I'm working with is pretty, you know, up to speed with everything. Yeah, that's like, nice. You're in a good group. <laughs> I am. I'm in a really good group. I've got, uh, I don't know, I work with a ton of, of uh, surgeons in the, in the city, and they're, they're good. <laughs> like, so, so how many arches are you doing, like, a week or a month? Um, you know what? That depends. Um, we... You know, I'm, I, it depends where I'm at. So like I said, at Chrysalis, I'm working strictly with uh, patients, seeing all the pre-op, post-op, final, and there could be, you know, two surgeons, you know, doing surgeries that day. There could be three, there could be one. It could be, you know, uh, the lab usually lets me know that they're dying because they have, you know, two <laughs> double arches going on. I've got three try-ins on the go, whatever. And they're, you know, those poor guys, they're, they, they're machines in there, but I'm, I think they're probably enjoying this break. Yeah, um, they work so hard, <laughs> but, uh, you know, just depending, I would say we're probably on average, I would say two arches a day anyways. Wow. Uh, just, yeah, I, I would say, I would say that would be a minimum. That's awesome. Talk about like experience. That. Some people so, do two arches a year. <laughs> yeah. So, I've done, yeah. I think, I don't know. I feel, I think I've done over 3000 um, wow. of these. So it's a, it's been a few, a few uh, under my belt. <laughs> so we've got like 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. What are the biggest complications that you see? Cause this is a big problem that we see, right? It's a new technique. Well, let's say relatively new. It's been around for decades, but mm -hmm. oftentimes people are still getting into it, right? I mean, right. you and I are still doing a lot of courses on, hey, here's all on There's always treatment. something to learn. Yeah. 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 And I know that people are concerned about complications. So what are the biggest complications you see? And this could be a prosthetic side, lab side, mm -hmm. um, surgery. Yeah. So I would say the biggest ones that I've seen has been when the surgery takes place and the prosthetic person isn't there. So uh -huh. I feel like the best outcome is going to be when you're all in the room together because everyone has to be invested in the outcome, you yeah. know? So when it's happening is when you want to, it makes it easier mm -hmm. unless you're used to working with a specific person and they know exactly what you want and you've outlined it. But I would say, um, you know, it's a, I would say the planning with the person that you're doing the surgery with, definitely being in the room together, knowing your expectations. Um, I had a patient come in that, unfortunately, he had been to his dentist who was restoring um, a full arch case 21 times since the implants had been placed. And 21 times, that's 21 a new record. 21 times, yeah. And oh so this poor gosh. guy came in, he had 16 implants 
which is uh -huh. more than I ever see, really. So eight in the top. On one arch? Oh, no, yeah, okay. I eight on the top, say, eight oh on the bottom. God. Yeah, yeah. And um, the surgeon did a great job. The implants all integrated. Everything was nice. The restorative dentist was in over his head. Nice guy. The, I mean, 21 times, that guy did not make a cent on this case, you oh, know, yeah, but for sure. he, he ended up, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, when he, when this patient came in, of course, he was at wit's end and yeah. out of the 16 implants, only three on the top and three on the bottom were being used with oh. plastic temporary copings. It was just mm -hmm. a, a nightmare. So anyway, this was handed to me to sort out and, and, and I did. And, and my, my, I bring this case up for one reason is that that dentist, he, he meant well, he, he was like very nice. Obviously the patient As most was getting do. to, a, yeah. yeah, he was getting to a litigious uh, point. But I would, you know, for me, I think everyone gets in over their head sometimes. You have to reach out to people and, and don't be afraid because everyone's been in that situation. So really call people, before, you know, call your reps, call your, you know, your colleagues and gain some, some assistance so that you don't get in into the situation. So that would be my biggest thing is just maybe stepping into a big thing like this and not having the right support or, uh, or just acknowledging that you're, you're you know, need help. I think that's a big thing. Um, the other issues that I've seen would be like almost more in a way down the road, post-op, five years down the road, patients coming in and their teeth have worn down and they weren't in the knowledge, they didn't have the knowledge that these weren't their final teeth. Like yeah. th they, they get, I guess, kind of told that these are their final prosthetics, but these are just ones that they're going to use for five to eight years. They are going to have to redo them at some point. And so a lot of patients are not in, I guess, informed properly that these yeah. weren't the, you know, they think that they've paid and that's it. That's so it, yeah. having the, the dialogue and the conversation about, you know, tooth breakage and, and as the teeth wear down, you know, if you have them, I always say like, if your teeth are built like this and over time they wear down, they get tight your anterior teeth start breaking off. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, I would say those are the biggest problems. Um, so we have some questions. Oh, okay. uh, if one of the implants fails, but the others don't, how do you mm -hmm. troubleshoot that? Yeah, so that's, and it really depends on where the implant that failed is. If, if it's a distal one, that poses more of a problem because it, then it's the cantilever extension that you right. need to, you know, to either shorten um, or, Typically, uh, you know, we, we have an implant that fails, we, the patient comes in, we take it out, we place a new one, and we attach it to the prosthetic same day. So whether it's in the same site or slightly distal or mesial. But How do you attach it to the prosthetic then? Mm -hmm. Like so if, you if, have a, if you have a patient that's had, you know, a, 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 their case for a few years, let's say, and they have a final mm -hmm. restoration with the titanium bar, and then you lose one of the distal implants. Yeah. Then so in get? that um, that's a good question because it does happen. Uh, so you can either take a high speed and drill out to the area where that implant failed and place one in, and loot it, pick it up with triad in the mouth. Okay. Or if you've maintained their transitional and have it stored on the model so it fits, then you can just take out that temporary coping, enlarge the hole and pick up there as well. But okay. I typically like doing it in the finals. I find that you know, they're more comfortable. These, you know, that it has the support of the bar still in it. You are cutting away a bit, but I feel like that is the better option. They, they don't like going back to their transitionals after the right. finals generally. Right. Someone's saying, I wish you had some classes in LA. Um, I'm teaching a class in LA with Sasha Jovanovic, a, a live course. If you're interested in that, just message me if you want to learn about, about this kind of stuff. Oh, and Rose at DSG. She's amazing. I love her. <laughs> You can wish her a happy late birthday. She has the best birthday in the planet. It's on um, St. Patrick's Day. Oh, that's a good <laughs> so, one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's amazing. <laughs> and then, so if you have a, a tooth pop off mm -hmm. and they do have their transitional, then you do a quick switch, right? Well, because we or have that. that that depends. Uh, yeah. If they're in a hurry, then yes, just switch them out and have them come back. Mm -hmm. If they want to hang around, they can just hang around and we do it while they're on site. And do you mostly see anterior teeth popping off or posterior teeth? 
No, both. Uh, mostly, I mean, I would say at the five year mark, it becomes mm -hmm. the anterior teeth. Because but, of what you just said, right? Yeah. How you've lost some vertical yeah. height and you've become a little more restricted. Yeah. You all of a sudden see their their bite is totally tight on the anterior and completely mm -hmm. off in the posterior. So um, we we do at that time, or I kind of tell them it's time to do like a retread or a vertical opening, we call it. And that's basically where we add material to the occlusal of the posterior teeth to open up the vertical again. Yeah. And, okay. and our technicians, you know, they're so good at it. They just add you know, radica or whatever, and uh, they just build the anatomy right back up. It's beautiful. Oh, that's cool. So you're bringing them like from here back up to here. Exactly. Yeah. That's cool. And so we give that as like a, it's kind of like they can use that for maybe a year or two. And then after that, then it's time to redo the teeth completely where we will strip them. If the bar is good, then we will strip the teeth from the bar and they will go back into their transitionals for approximately a month. And then after we've done the new try and a new setup on those uh, temp or, uh, titanium bars, then we'll process. If they, if the bars need to be redone, then you know, then there's a new cost for that too. Okay, that makes sense. Um, how often do implants under dentures fail? Any common causes? What's your opinion on that? How sorry, what's the question? How often it's... do implants under dentures? Yeah, I'm guessing that means. Like oh, for fixed, like, like for let's say all in four cases. Is it under dentures fail? So is that like for like I a think locator we're denture? I'm not sure exactly what that means. Maybe you can restate your question. But I would say locators I've seen more failures with mm -hmm. than with fixed restorations. Um, in general, removable cases have more complications. Yeah. Anytime I you have something so moving in the mouth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is Absolutely. why I pretty much stopped doing removable implant cases. Very rarely will I. Yeah. Um, we don't. Because it's, like... it's a pain in the butt. Overdentures. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think overdentures have more failure because they're not splinted. I think that um, even though they're sometimes more cleansable, let's say, because the patient mm -hmm. can take them off. The patient mm -hmm. doesn't take them off and clean. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that, I think that's a, that's a hard one. In terms of diagnosis, how do you know how many implants to diagnose? What's the bare minimum? Well, I would say bare minimum on top would be four, bare minimum on the bottom would be three. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you want to over-engineer. You have to take into account how long of implants you can put in, how wide of implants you can put in, the bone stability, the bone density of the patient. Oh, this is a good question for you. What kind of warranty do you give these patients? Mm, that is a good question. So yeah. we give a five-year warranty, basically. Okay. Uh, five years for anything like the normal wear and tear, whatever, just normal. Uh, and then if there's an implant failure or then we will replace it. And if mm -hmm. that means the bar, then the bar is replaced. Um, the companies generally uh, pitch in with a five year. So in a yeah. five year warranty. Um, so if a tooth pops off, then you guys repair it, no charge. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Anything okay. is covered in, in five years. Yeah. I mean, and I say five years, but I mean, try and collect money seven years down the road from someone that's repaired or when it really depends because we you know when we did this 15 years ago compared to now we've learned as we go so the patients that we yeah. you know treated 10 years ago have longer warranties than the patients that have them now <laughs> right <laughs> so, I know that sounds like weird but you learn as you go and you're like oh we never thought about you know that or whatever this or that or that yeah yeah <laughs> It's not cool. the never ever plan, right? But yes, yeah, that's what a lot of patients think. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. thanks for taking the time. I yeah, think this is really course. helpful to me because I had a lot of questions about denturists because we're we're not so aware of them here. And mm -hmm. um, you, you know, guys was, have just a few states that have. Yeah, it, I think not... we have four or five states, yeah. something like that. But yeah. um, who knows? Maybe it'll change, or maybe this will change it. I don't know. Maybe, yeah. We'll see. I think you guys are doing really cool stuff, and it's. It's um it's a thing that's definitely needed, you know. I think you have yeah. you have dentists that are restoring cases that don't know what they're doing. You also have lab technicians that don't know what they're doing on mm -hmm. certain cases. So anytime I think people can get a little more subspecialized, 
um, yeah. still while understanding other other aspects of the profession. I think that's always a good thing. So yeah, um, and I have to yeah. ask a question. Where's Butterball? Sure. I was excited Butterball. to see her little face. Where is she? <laughs> Let me see. Let me see if I can grab okay. her real quick. <laughs> Where's she at? Here she is. Oh, yeah. Oh, big girl. Oh. Everyone. Oh, there been waiting. she is. <laughs> yeah. I was expecting to see her in her little chair in the back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Poor thing. There she you is. Know, I feel like everyone on this planet has been watching Netflix nonstop and out of, you know, the States, of course, I think everyone's watched Tiger King. <laughs> yeah. Like, you guys, like, does everyone have tigers down there as pets? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in Florida and Oklahoma, it seems like. It's a good thing, Butterball. <laughs> They're not in California. Should be That's a good right. Snack. Yeah, she'd be a great snack. <laughs> yeah. High protein. Not all fat. <laughs> well, I appreciate you uh, having me on today. Sure. And, uh, yeah. It's nice we'll to, to see you. We'll have to do it again. We've got a lot of questions. So. Yeah, sure. Anytime. <laughs> all right. See good. you soon. Well, you take care. Okay. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye.